following its conclusion, should I say. Can I remind members that the translation facilities are available and those attending on Zoom to choose your language of choice. For those wishing to speak in the chamber, please raise your hand. And for those on Zoom, please use the raise hand function. I will alternate between the speakers in the chamber and those online using Zoom. For those attending remotely, please note uh, that those in the chamber will be enabled to use the chat facility. Committee members, are attend committee members who are attending remotely are required to leave their cameras on throughout the, deba the debate and when voting in order to maintain the integrity of the decisions uh, making pro process. If you do not uh, it, sorry, if you do need to leave the meeting temporarily, pop a message in the chat function so that Democratic service, Services officers are aware and then let us know when you return. I expect everyone present uh, and participating in the meeting to conduct themselves appropriately and be respectful to each other. Uh, that applies to members, officers and everyone in the public gallery, which uh, unfortunately there isn't any this evening. So we will move on to item one, which is apologies for absence. And uh, our committee officer, Jane. Yes, uh, I have an apology from Cathy Augustine and Councillor Emery will be joining us a little bit later. Thank you. Item two is declarations of interest, code of local government conduct. I would like to remind members that they must declare the nature of any of their declared personal interests. Uh, members, are there any? No, okay. Then we will move on to item three, which is urgent matters, which I'm not aware of any. No urgent matters, Chair. Okay, thank you. So item four is to is the minutes, is to approve and sign as a correct record the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 15th of February 2020 through 2023, and they are on pages four to fourteen. Um I don't think I'll bother going through them because I'm sure the members would have uh, would have already seen them. If any, everybody is happy, I'd look for a proposer and seconder. Councillor Harry to propose. Anybody else to second? Councillor Nia, thank you. Uh, if you're happy, members, could you please show by raising your hands? Okay, that's good. Thank you. Those minutes have been approved. Then we will move on to item five, which is to receive the minutes of the local area forums. So the first one is the local area forum West, uh, which was on the 9th of February this year, pages 15 to 19. And these are going to be presented by Councillor Sharon, Sharon Dolman. Good evening, Sharon. Oh, she's not. OK. Is uh, Councillor Anne McCaffrey online? All right. So uh, in that case, I'm just looking for a proposer, Councillor Harry is happy to propose those minutes. Uh, do we have a seconder? <laughs> Sam Cotton, thank you. Uh, if members are happy, could you please uh, show by raising your hands? Thank you, those minutes have uh, been approved. We'll move on to the local area forum central, which is on pages 20 to 25. And that meeting was on the 1st of February uh, this year. Uh, these will be presented by Councillor Cheryl Carlisle. Evening, Cheryl. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you for that. You haven't got away so lightly, you see, I'm here. So I'll, <laughs> I'll present these for you. Uh, yeah, just to say we had very informative um, presentations with James Harland and team presenting the RLDP uh, update uh, for the central area, which highlighted um, members' concerns around health provision should there be new housing developments. Uh, Helen Goddard came to talk to us about the essential work being done in community libraries, which, which um, was wonderful, and we congratulated her on her recent award. We then had an overview of the consultations in the uh, Colin Bay Town Centre from Ellen Edwards and Dylan Jones. The section on Station Road was attended by Planning Aid Wales, um, re represented by Sam Whitehouse. They're currently doing the place plan for Colwyn Bay. And we hope that they took on board um, all the comments that members made. We were also joined by, uh, thanks to Councillor Abdul, we were joined by Colin Flanagan of Colwyn Bay Business Forum, who had done a comprehensive survey of local businesses uh, and 
uh, the conclusion was 90% of them wish to see Station Road reopened to business. It was an extremely um, informative meeting. I'm going to pack to agenda for our, our next meeting. So thank you very much, Chair, for that. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, very much appreciated that you uh, presented those minutes. Uh, so if the committee members are happy with those, I'm looking for a proposer and seconder. Councillor Harry, to propose. Uh, anybody online? Uh, Sam Cotton again. Thank you, Sam. Uh, members, if you could please show by raising your hands. Thank you very much. Those minutes have also been uh, confirmed. So we'll now move on to item six, which is to receive the minutes of the North Wales Police and Crime Panel, uh, which is for information only. They are on pages 26 to 31. I'm sure that members have uh, um, read these minutes. Um, again, I'm looking for a proposer and seconder, Councillor Harry. Bernice, are you seconding Councillor Harry? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so if members are happy with those minutes of the police and crime panel, could you please raise your hands? Lovely. Thank you very much, members. So item seven is to review the forward work programme, and this will be presented by jo Dawn Hughes, our scrutiny committee services officer. Uh, thank you, Dawn. Uh, thanks, Chair. So just a, a quick update. So um, the LDP timetable of reports has now been finalised and I think it's updated on your forward plans, on your on the forward plan in your agenda packs. Just so you're aware, I'm also currently in the process of devising the draft forward work programme for 23-24 year with the Chair, Vice Chair and Heads of Service. Once I've got a draft, I will email members of the committee separately um, asking if they have any further items they want to include on the forward plan. Obviously, that will be subject to completion of the necessary scrutiny topic form, which will then obviously be assessed by chairs and vice chairs using the scrutiny topic criteria. That's my update, Chair. OK, thank you, Dawn. Are there any questions on the forward work programme or the uh, combined forward work programme members? If not, I'm looking for a proposer and seconder. Councillor Harry is happy to propose. Councillor Sam Cotton again. Um, so if members are happy with those, could you please uh, raise and raise your hands and show? Lovely. Thank you very much, members. Those uh, uh, board work programmes have been approved. So we'll now move on to item eight, which is questions to cabinet members. Um, cabinet member questions from Councillor Harry to Councillor Emily Owen. I believe this has been answered via a, a, an email. So, uh, Dawn? Yeah, so if I take that for you, Chair. Yes, so unfortunately, Councillor Emery is unable to attend uh, this evening. So the protocol for questions to Cabinet members does allow for a written response to be given to the questioner. And Councillor Harry has confirmed that he's happy with that. So he will receive a, a response to the uh, question uh, separately. OK, thank you, Dawn. And thank you, Harry, for being so understanding. All right, so we will now move on to item nine, which is to consider reports by the head of VRF on the following matter. Uh, so we've got agenda items 9i, or 9.1 is it, landed no federal goat management plan, pages 76 to 95. And this will be presented by Sophie Birchall. Just, just, oh. I'll just introduce the chair. Sorry, it's going to be introduced no, by Councillor no. Jeff. Uh, Stuart, the cabinet member for um, for neighbourhood services and environment, roads yeah. and facilities. Attached Sorry, report, Jeff. Thank you, Chair. Attached <laughs> to the report is a proposed management plan for the um, handling of the goats. The purpose of the plan is to document how the feral goat population of Clandidno is monitored and managed by a partnership agency <laughs> to secure the future survival of the herd and to allow for coexistence of the herd alongside the local community. The feral goats usually live on the Great Arm but have historically roamed free in adjacent parts of the town. In recent years, small groups of male billy goats have extended their reach to various areas within Craigadon. Um, officers were asked to prepare a management report, and I'm delighted to say, in fact, that Sophia is here tonight to actually take that further. So I, Chair, I ask you to say. Thank you, Chair. 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 Th
Thank you, Jeff. I very much appreciate it. Uh, Sophie, thank you for being with us this evening. And uh, take it away. Thank you. Um, so, a bit of background to the plan. Um, as Councillor Jeff just touched on, the plan's been created to document how the feral goat population of the Great Orm and Granito are monitored and managed by the various um, partnership agencies. This plan has been written and structured to inform the public and also hold the answers to any questions the public may have on how the goats are managed, by whom, and how we make the decisions to monitor and manage the goats um, in this way. So the first four sections of the plan have been structured to essentially provide the information on why a partner agency um, management plan is, is now required. Starting off with the introduction, um, the introduction touches on how the plan is intended to secure the future survival of the herd and importantly, allow for the coexistence of the herd alongside the local community and its needs. Um, you'll see in the introduction that it explains how the plan has been created to set out the roles and responsibilities of each partnership organisation involved in managing the feral goats. And it describes the procedures used throughout the life cycle of the plan to monitor activity associated with feral goat management. Section two, just scrolling down of the report, provides some historical background. Not everybody um, is aware of how the goats um, came to Clandidno and to, uh, onto the Orm. So the plan provides a brief history of this, uh, dating back to 1819, when the Kashmir goats were first brought from France, um, uh, from Persia over to France, um, going back to 1844, when Queen Victoria um, presented uh, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers with the first Kashmiri goat, mascot goat. Then to the 1890s, um, where the goats were lifted, um, gifted uh, to Lord Mostyn by Queen Victoria. And this brief history section of the plan shows the key historic periods in time in between the ones I've just briefly mentioned, and also um, covering more recent key milestones, um, including the involvement of experts such as the Animal and Plant Healthcare Agency to help with population management strategies and the introduction of uh, the Gonacon birth control vaccination. Moving on to section three of the plan, uh, this describes the current situation, which is essential, essentially ultimately the reason why we've been asked and tasked with developing this goat management plan. Uh, the section um, of the plan explains how uh, the goats have become a much loved symbol of Clandidno. And although they usually live on the Great Orm, they're often now spotted around the town during winter and spring. It also explains uh, the roaming of the goats and how this roaming has made international news over recent years. Um, and it explains that although roaming is something that has actually always happened, um, you know, as the seasonal and biological events, which will always influence the behavior of the goats, it highlights how COVID-19 provided an opportunity with the town being more empty for the goats to become more adventurous and confident and roam further afield, which has continued to happen long after restrictions on human movement have been lifted and even now um, when the town has returned back to normal life. The final introductory section of the report is, um, explains legal responsibility. The goats of Clandidno have roamed in a wild state for over 100 years. Although they were once um, under the ownership of Lord Mostyn as a gift from Queen Victoria, the goats reverted to a wild state and are therefore legally regarded as wild animals. Therefore, there's not one single person or organisation that is legally responsible for the goat populations of Clandidno. Um, if at any point they were to be confined, then they would become somebody's legal property. So as the goats are feral, it's not the council's legal responsibility to keep the goats on the Great Orm by way of fencing or containment. If damage is being caused to adjoining properties, the onus is therefore on those property, own, uh, property owners to keep the goats out. Additionally, um, a landowner has a legal entitlement to act on behalf of an animal's welfare if a wild animal is in distress whilst on their land. And the section goes on to explain how the council may also act to control populations of wild animals that reside on its land and describes various um, relevant legislations relevant to managing the feral goat populations and associated habitats. So in section five of the plan, uh, we move from to the background into documenting whom is involved and what their responsibilities are, including Conway County Borough Council, 
Llandudno Town Council, Moston Estates, Natural Resources Wales, and both the RSPCA in a national in, in a national capacity and um, as as a local Aberconway branch. Section six of the plan um, describes how the goat population is managed. Um, it's structured to explain the approach to sustainable management of a population of the Clandidno feral goats, how it was uh, developed in partnership with UK Government Animal and Plant Health um, Agency, the RSPCA, NRW, and through local veterinary um, support. And the section um, describes how this approach uses a combination of population monitoring and management strategies, which aim to keep the herd of goats within current target population ranges by um, biannual bi during the spring and autumn goat counts of the whole herd on the Great Orm, spring kid counts, um, roundups for health checks and administration of gonacon contraceptive uh, vaccinations, and through relocation, um, relocating groups of goats to conservation organisation sites um, in the UK. It also explains that the target population is calculated annually based on the demographics of the herd, um, as determined through the counts I've just um, mentioned to maintain a sustainable herd in, in the habitat, um, the available habitat environment. The section of this report then goes on to describe when, how and whom undertakes goat counts and how the outputs from the counts are used to undertake population modelling. Um, it explains that goat roundups um, are undertaken, when they're undertaken, which is currently free yearly, why they're undertaken at this interval, because the Gonacon vaccination lasts for approximately three years. It details where the roundups are carried out and what is required in terms of resource. The remaining content of section six explains about relocation strategies that have been used as an additional means of controlling the population since 2001 for conservation grazing. And it describes the legislative and licensing requirements which are involved, along with the organisations um, involved and where previous relocations have taken place. Section seven of um, the plan um, relates to intervention protocols. Again, this section recognises that no party has a, a no single party has a legal responsibility to contain the goats, and in doing so, would result in the loss of feral status. This section um, therefore documents that non-intervention is the default course of action. However, it recognises that occasional and scheduled intervention is required and will be enacted upon when necessarily, and most importantly, when it will be most successful. There's been, shall I say, lots of speculation over the last few years on why the goats behave in certain ways at certain times of year. Um, some people, there's some common thoughts out there where people think that the goats must be hungry or they've not got enough shelter. Um, but the reality is um, the experts and the evidence has given firm in indication that this is not the case. Um, the billies who roam, they wander at the same time um, every year. It is only as a result of COVID that they've wandered you know, further afield, gained more confidence and continue to do so. Um, and it's through seasonal changes um, where the nannies are busy looking after the kids and they have no work to do, the billies don't have a job there for a few months, that they become curious, begin roaming um, until they need to then return up to the orm in preparation for rutting season. So for this reason, we, following expert advice um, as a, a partnership agency um, and following the knowledge we have, have set out the intervention protocols defined in this section of the report. The plan therefore states that intervention will be occasional and scheduled at the right time during April and May, when it's more likely that the goats will stay at the Orm, um, as outside of this period, any collection attempts before this period are likely to be highly unsuccessful and results in the, will result in the goats not staying at, at the Orm. When the goats are settled in a single location for two weeks, if the location is safe for both the goats and the individuals involved in the roundup due to health and safety risks involved in rounding up goats in an urban area. It's only at those acceptable times when the operation is likely to be successful, but CCBC will work with Moston Estates and the other partner agencies to carry out this task. Um, quickly moving on to section eight of this plan, um, which basically covers 
which partnership agency can be contacted for common issues uh, that are wanting to be reported by the public and gives clarity um, to people accessing the plan on which agency should be contacted in the first instance. So if it's an injured, as an example, if it's an injured or distressed goat on the arm, they come to uh, Conway Council. If it's in, injured or distressed goat in the town, initially the RSPCA. If there's a goat causing, um, you know, if he's fouling on a highway um, and a high amenity pavement, again, they'd come to, to the council. If a goat was causing obstruction on a public highway, they'd contact North Wales Police. So the plan covers who needs to be contacted for which types of issues, and the following section in the plan provides information on how you can actually contact each of those partnership agencies under those um, you know, common scenarios. Finally, um, the last section of the report is focused on documenting long-term management objectives. So at this point, um, I just want to highlight, highlight that the plan is intended to be subjected to an annual review, and therefore these are the initial objectives that the um, partnership agencies have, have, have put out there that can be developed and added at the time. Um, they can be developed to, sorry, losing my trailer for, they can be developed um, and further um, added to at the time of the next and any future reviews which are undertaken. The initial objectives, though, provide the opportunity to ensure that um, you know, the partner agencies are monitoring and managing the actions taken under the plan to ensure the future survival of the herd that the herd and the local communities are living in harmony, um, but damage to any um, habitats is limited. And importantly, that we're doing our best to seek funding to invest in things like life cycle monitoring and planning toolkits and looking at new management techniques, uh, techniques which could include uh, trial and GPS technology to track the goats' um, you know, behaviour um, and um, implement technology that will help us drive and deliver future action and sustainable management practices. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sophie. And uh, I want to congratulate, congratulate you on an excellent piece of work here. Um, the goats are synonymous with uh, Tlandidno, part of the history of the town and part of the furniture and welcomed by the visitors and the many people that live in the area, although not all. Um, I will open up to the floor, uh, Councillor Garonwe. I'd like to, uh, I, having been part of the working group that was set up by this committee, I would also like to thank Sophie for the fantastic amount of work she's put into uh, putting all this information together, looking at all the legalities, all the obligations to do with this uh, situation. And I think it is a plan that was fully endorsed by the uh, working group. Uh, and I think it's a proactive way forward Obviously, it will have to be reviews from time to time. One of the issues that is becomes obvious to me as, as a, a landowner and a manager of livestock that one of the issues that we haven't identified is the, the massive amount of increase of use of the arm by the public. Since COVID started, an awful lot of people have taken up walking, much more dog ownership. Uh, I know from practice that coats uh, do not favour land that uh, is inhabited by dogs. So we may in the future well have to look at, at that as a possible uh, deterrent because certainly dogs and goats do not mix because they will avoid the sense of uh, where dogs have been. So that is an issue mm -hmm. that may need to be considered going forward um, because there are health reasons for both uh, the goats where there is uh, an awful lot of uh, of dog walking, which in itself can have disease problems. So there are a number of options that may well have to be looked at in the future if the current arrangements that have been put in place uh, deem not to be appropriate. But I think this is a massive step forward. Mm. And with all partners taking responsibility for their element of uh, management. OK, thank you very much, Garami. Councillor Harry. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I'll, I'll echo. Uh, the comments just made by the cabinet member. I think this is a really positive and constructive document that I think sets out uh, what both this council and other partner organisations will do in, in respect of managing and looking after the feral goats in and around Slander. No, um, the the two questions I've got. The first one relates to section eight of the plan, uh, where we look at the different uh, duties or responsibilities of partnership agencies. And I'm, I'm looking at the bit specifically about a goat causing concern on a public highway. 
and that this is a North Wales police issue. Now, that doesn't come as a surprise to me. I would have expected it would be a North Wales police issue. But many of the residents that contact me about goats raise concerns about goats being on the highway. And whenever I say to them, I'm pretty sure this is a North Wales police issue, contact them. Uh, anecdotally, the majority of those residents come back to me and say, we have contacted the police and they've assured us you need to contact Conway County Borough Council. So what I'd like to understand is what sort of discussions have there been with North Wales Police so we can be very clear that they know what their responsibility is. Um, I'd, I would just like to be reassured around that point uh, so that there isn't a confusion in, in the future. Um, the second question I've got, and it relates to that section as well, and it's something that's been raised of me by a resident who has spotted that this is coming uh, to this evening's meeting is just around the um, two report types around potentially injured or distressed goats on on the orm or in standard no and they've asked what what steps would the council or we rspca necessarily be taking in in those circumstances if a report like that came in i i can appreciate uh those reports could be incredibly varied um because it's a pretty wide remit isn't it distress or or injury but I'd, I'd be grateful just for a bit of an explanation around what practical steps might be taken if a report like that came in so two questions thank you yeah th um thanks councillor harry on the the police issue yes we have had dialogue with north wales police i think they will look at it in terms of risk so um, a group of goats in town on a 30 mile an hour, soon to be 20 mile an hour road, they would look at it and think, what is the risk of that? They're going to be on the other side fairly fairly shortly. Um, I think where, where the police have taken proactive action and there's been, been sort of um, fairly rapid then liaison with our out of hours highways or in hours highways team is is if they're on the 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 link road on the dual carriageway actually where you've got higher speed vehicles so um i think uh, i wouldn't read the the plan to say every time you see a goat in any road call the police because they they they're not not going to do something if if it's a you know a, a risk to to uh to to um human life or, or serious disruption of traffic that's when they would get involved they and like any highway um issue they would attend to see what's happening in the first place but they'll be pretty quickly on the phone to our highways department to say you know, either close the road put up some warning signs get some cones out or or, or whatever you need to do so um yeah that's that's in response to that on the injured goats thing. Do you, uh, so on yeah, that. basically, if if there's a goat and it's injured, yeah, and it's in distress, um, if it's up the arm, as we said, you know, our country park, in the first instance, um, you know, our country park off, um, officers and wardens will assess the situation and reach out to um, the RSPCA. I've had an actual email today from the RSPCA, um, which was sent to our country park warden, you know, reiterating that they've had another review of the plan. And it's not just that they will assist with injured goats in town. They will, the same applies if we need assistance at the Orm. So, you know, the RSPCA, obviously, um, you know, if they're not going to, if there's a distress, yeah, and there's something injured, then they're on board as part of this management plan to come and, to come and help and um, fully, you know, accept that role. Okay. Um, yeah, can I bring in Councillor Louise Emery? Um, Dwin Hoffi Gerve a Dwin Dimon Hoffi Gerve. Like goats, and I um, don't like goats. Goats. <laughs> uh, so me and Harry receive uh, every single week somebody moaning about the goats generally. Um, and I realise that it is a first world problem. And those of us that are lucky enough to have gardens in the beautiful ward of Gogath and Mostyn just need to improve our fencing um, and plant lavender which they don't like and hydrangeas which they don't eat um, but it is it is quite distressing for people it takes a lot to for me to shed a tear but believe me when uh, the last rose plant that my father used to buy for my mum every year was eaten by the goats that was a very dark day for me and at that point between them and Hothi Gerva um, however with Harry my main concern is is the issues with the public with the public highway 
Um, and, and the numbers. So I'm looking at this target in the report of 130. Now, anecdotally, if you go and speak to John at the Pink Farm on top of the Orm, he'll say that when it looked like they were over 70 on the Orm in the olden days, there'd be a phone call to Austin Estates who would who would cull the cull the herd so they were within 70. Now those days are long gone. But this target of 130, I know at the last count, if I think if I remember correctly, was 153 were counted. Um, and I'm not sure they included the Nantigamma ones. So my question is, I've seen the spiel as to why it's 130. I want to know why it's not less, because in the old days when if we saw a goat, it's like, oh, there's a goat, that's amazing. And now they're everywhere. So, so who's come up with 130? Um, and then secondly, does that 130 include the, the males that are now permanently residing in Nantigamma, who, who I don't think will ever come back to the Orm and what, what's the plan now for those boys? They're the ones that are sitting on that very busy roundabout. So two questions there. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms with um, you know, um, the figures and the target population, um, we've we've had what we've what we do is as part of that goat count, uh, we take all the information, the counts, the information, and we we get um, we have an expert um, who helps us with the population modelling using um, a population toolkit, which was originally done based on you know, research and a study, um, which was done you know, through, um, I think, involvement you know, with the universities and different experts at the time, um, the animal um, animal plant and health, sorry, animal health and plant agency. Um, as part, in terms of the other question with the, the last goat count, which was around 153, yes, um, that, that figure is correct. And we are currently actively looking at relocation strategies and reaching out to different organizations to see if we can get some uh, relocation happening um, on the grounds of conservation, because it's got to be you know, for the right place um, for the goats. We can't just um, just send them off anywhere, but there's organizations which we, we have, we've got relationships with, and the Countryside Warden has actively been doing that over the last couple of months reaching out and the nantigamma boys what are we doing about them yeah but the nantigamma boys are included in the in the numbers in the count okay can i uh, please bring in councillor uh, austin roberts uh mr Kadiri. thank you chair Yes, this is a problem, isn't it? And it has been a problem for years. I'd like to ask one question to Sophie. And forgive me, I haven't read the, report, read the reports fully, but I would like to thank her for it. She says that nobody is responsible for these animals, but it's obvious to me that there is an owner, which is the Mustin estate as it was a gift from Queen Victoria for the Lord Mustin. Have we ever asked uh, Mustin Estate if they would be happy to take more responsibility with regards to these goats? Hello. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the uh, King Horror Austin. Um, Thank you, Councillor Austin. Relation to Mostyn Estates, they are one of the partners involved in the monitoring and management of the goats. I have to say they have um, cooperated fully with us on this. Um, they uh, it's through their one of their tenant farmers that we arrange the. The, the goat roundups and they also contribute to the um the the, the cost of the vaccination program and health checks and, and roundups that that happen sort of every two or three years. Um, as, as far as um sort of confirming the legal status, we have been through our legal department to confirm that. Um, and also remembering that the the, the the Great Orm is is leased from or the country park is leased from Mostyn Estates by by the council, and so that's the um, the the how the 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 council have kind of in, inherited the the role of managing the goats while they are on council land. So I I, I think it would be it would be difficult to um, 
to pin actual ownership on Mostyn Estates. And the legal advice we've had is, is that they are not owned by Mostyn Estates, but they have fully cooperated with us in the, the monitoring and management of the herd. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Mandy Hawkins. Hi, Chair. Thanks very much. Um, I had actually put my um, hand out, but no problem. <laughs> I just wanted to say, um, Sophie and the team that have worked on this, thank you very much. Um, I know it's much much appreciated by all. Um, and secondly, just to say that I am obviously um, a councillor on the ward with Harry and Louise. Um, so I'm actually surprised to hear that they're saying um, they get reports of this every week. Because I've, I've got to be honest, in the time I've been a councillor, I can count the times I've had reports, you know, of them of residents coming to me less than um, the number of fingers on, on one hand. So, um, yeah, <laughs> must just be luck at the draw, Javi and Louise. <laughs> oh, bad but, luck. Yeah, you carry on. <laughs> Take care. All right. Thank you, uh, Councillor Mandy. Um, Councillor Paul Lecoq. Elected. Um, I did give a heads up to Andrew and Sophie and Jeff and people about this, uh, in a sense, question, and I was hoping they might have addressed it in the presentation. Uh, I commend the work that's been done on this report and the presentation. It's uh, I've got no disagreement with that aspect. Of it. My slight concern is those um, vulnerable landowners and tenants um, because though I fully accept it is for the private landowner to protect their property and as uh, Louise has said that means building higher fences or walls gates uh, and maybe as she says planting particular plants and all of that uh, which is fine but then of course there are landowners um, who are vulnerable and even with the assistance and support of family and friends um, struggle to if you like build those protections around their house and gardens um, there are even some landowners that struggle to do that even though they're not vulnerable because of particular conservation heritage planning issues which mean that they have difficulty building ever larger walls and um, fences and there's a particular area uh, where where walls can't be built any higher I understand um, and and then of course with tenants tenants are in a particular problem because if they're private landlord who owns the land doesn't increase the size of the fence or build a, build a higher wall or repair a wall or whatever, they're in that difficult position that they have to try and get an, an improvement notice against the private landlord to get that work done and improvement notices to do boundary fences and walls and the like are not easy to pursue and of course as a tenant you might well be anxious if I pursue this complaint with my landlord uh, my tenancy might be at risk so I suppose the question I'm really asking is for those private landlords and or tenants who struggle to have agency over their fences and gates and walls how how can we assist those people? Because it seems to me that particularly the vulnerable people, thinking older person, still living at home with dementia, something like that, they have uh, rights under the Social Services and Wellbeing uh, Wales Act. I'm just wondering how all that pans out. For most private landlords, it's their job to sort it out. But there are... A significant minority of landlords and tenants 
who will struggle to protect their property. Well, interesting, and uh, Paul, um, my thought is, if you're being contacted by these people, why aren't they contacting the local members with those same issues? But I will ask the officers to uh, perhaps come back. Are we legally required to assist people that may be in need to secure their properties from these uh, from these goats? Uh not not in terms of the um of the management of the feral goat herd i think it's possibly a, a wider question of how we assist um vulnerable people and how we prioritize assistance and for what um what, what the the plan is doing is trying to balance the welfare and future survival of the herd with the needs of residents and so they can coexist with the local community. And I think we have tried to uh, have regard for the needs of residents, because if we didn't, we wouldn't be here presenting a plan. We, we, yeah. we wouldn't be monitoring numbers, managing numbers, uh, relocating goats, arranging for roundup and transportation of goats. So all these things we'd, we're, we're doing and, and we've committed to do, and we've now got in, in writing through the plan, are things that we have come up with in, in consultation with experts. I'm 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 not an expert in goats, though I probably know more about goats than I ever thought I would when uh, I, I started my my job. So we rely on the people who, who know what they're doing. Our country park wardens who've been um, who've been um, dealing with the goats for a number of years. The RSPCA, local vets, the NRW. And staff and uh, elected members who, who've had a lot of experience with this. And what we've tried to present in the plan is things which are feasible and funded. There are, in, and that's in the long term objectives, there, there are more things that we might possibly do in the future and look at, but we haven't come to you today to say we're going to do geofencing based on GPS, which is going to keep all the, the goats in one place without. The need for fencing we don't that's still something to be explored but that is something that will come in the long-term objectives so what we try to present is, is try to balance say that the, the welfare of the herd everyone in the community um but if if there are any further ideas for specific interventions that that we haven't thought of and that that councillor paul has ideas on we'd be we'd be happy to consider them okay Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, well, I was just about to say our final speaker, but I can see Councillor Louise has got her hand up. Uh, well, this will be the, I'm sure, the final speech. Just to back back up what Paul was said, there are a number of residents from our ward. I presume it's more the Gogoff ward than Moston, and perhaps there's a, you know, since the change of boundaries, mm. perhaps they're just contacting me and Harry still. But there are a number of of residents who really really find it distressing where their little garden is, is eaten alive and there's really not a lot they can they can do about it so I will back Paul up on that but the, this plan is great it, it won't give a solution to the residents I'm not sure what the residents want because they do love the goats and at the same time hate them when they're in their garden and if we ever suggested culling we'd all be you know thrown out of bottle on deb in an instant so so this I'm quite harsh really with residents is that there is a plan there is a target and you just have to protect your own space as much as we can but really interested to hear what could be coming up next but there we go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Louise. Yeah. Councillor Garonwe, you've been waiting patiently. I thought you were going to be the last speaker, but Harry's got his hand up as well. So. Thank you for letting me to come back. But certainly there's a couple of points that have been raised by yeah. members. Uh, the point that Harry raised about the response to the police is certainly one that they do need to take the, the responsibility seriously. Now, I've got years of experience of this, of being a grazer on the Carnella, which is a very similar situation. Any livestock that comes down onto the A55 or onto the roads around Penomal, the police uh, are called to and attend to. Uh, the only difference with the situation in Penomal, Tarnachan, is that there are owners for those sheep, so they contact the owners and they can resolve the situation as has been said already in this meeting, there is no uh, no one willing to take ownership of the situation. Uh, most of the states are playing a part in trying to resolve the management of the situation. So that is something that 
I will, when we have our open spaces meeting with the police every fortnight, if there is instance, I will raise that issue again with them because we do have represented from the police on the open spaces. Mm. On the issue that Louise raised about the numbers, I think we do need to consider is the number too high because certainly there has been a change on the OM over the last few years. There's a new tenant on the OM. The, the, the farm was bought by National Trust, as we know, and they are changing their grazing uh, arrangements for keeping a more uh, livestock on the on the OM and also the fact that they're keeping different types of breeds of sheep that will graze what normally would be grazed by goats. They are uh, the, the Hardwick sheep that, that uh, tend to graze, that graze similar vegetation to the goats. So there is more pressure on the OM than ever. So we may well have to look at reducing the numbers that the OM can sustain. So that is something that needs to be reviewed as Louise said, uh, and as far as taking ownership of private land and land owned by Muslim State, we have no legal uh, responsibility to do that, no legal right to do that. So to take on civil issues is something beyond our uh, ability and beyond our resources, quite frankly, and I certainly wouldn't condone taking on additional responsibility when we have so many other pressures on our services. Okay, thank you, Councillor Gromley. Councillor Harry, our final speaker on this uh, on this item. Oh, thank you, Chairman. I'll I'll make it quick. I promise. I was, I was going to propose that we recommend adoption of the plan to cabinet. So it's a recommendation to cabinet. Okay. This item thank you. It, I think so. Happy to propose uh, that. Do we have a? Oh, Councillor Austin. Uh, Mr. Kudiris. I'd like to second that, please, Chair. So, do we have a, a seconder? What's that, Austin? Sorry, I didn't get my headset on quick enough. All Thank right. you, Councillor Austin. Be um, I said that I'll second that. Thank you, Chair. If you are happy that this excellent piece of work uh, by Sophie is uh, uh, presented to Cabinet for adoption, uh, then please show in the proper manner by raising your hands or your digital hand online. Yeah, I think that is... Are you doing a count? Keep them up, members. Is it a full house? And two in the chamber. It's a full house, I think, isn't it? Yes. Not quite. Okay. Anybody against? Any abstentions? Anybody against? Can't see any hands. No, it is carried. Thank you. Thank you, members. And uh, thanks, Andrew and Sophie. Excellent work. Thank you. So we'll now move on to the next item, which is item 10. Are we on? Yeah, that's the one. So it's planning obligations and viability guidance note on pages 96 to uh, 141. And these would be well would have been presented by Councillor Emery Owen, but unfortunately she's um, um, caring tonight. I think for children and somebody and a father-in-law. So I presume that Richard Clark is online. Oh, is it James? No, it's going to be Richard. Thank you. Yeah. Richard's going to bring you forward with us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, James. Thanks, Richard. Thank Take it away, Thank sir. You. Thank you, Chair. So yes, this um, uh, this is to present the, the planning obligations and viability guidance note. And uh, most members will be aware of planning obligations that, that can be sought from developments to, to support things like affordable housing, public open space, um, library improvements, highways. And those are, are set out in existing adopted uh, policies and SPGs which define what we collect money for, in some cases, how we how much we can collect from, from development. And uh, some of those can be on-site, such as, as open space or affordable housing that a developer has to provide as part of, of a development. And sometimes that's off-site, so we ask the developer to pay a commuted sum, um, which is, is then spent by the, um, on providing those those infrastructure um, and to control this it's there's a legal agreement um which is the, 
the, the planning obligation that, that needs to be signed in order for the, the planning permission to be granted. And uh, the, at the moment, all of the, the policies and guidance that, that are used for making decisions relating to, uh, to, to planning matters about planning obligations are, are in uh, adopted LDP, they're in the affordable housing SPG and our, our uh, planning obligations SPG, as well as parts of national legislation and national planning policy as well and the, the the purpose really of of the guidance note is is to bring bring lots of those pieces together to give some clarity to the the council's position with planning obligations and and viability and it's uh so that it, it allows um allows any interested parties to then go and find the more detailed guidance but as if members who've, who've looked through the planning obligations spg for example it's, it's quite a big document and not very accessible so uh this is something that is is easier to access and understand um but it it doesn't add anything uh any it doesn't bring any particularly new guidance to the table so it's uh, it's just clarifying the existing position so the uh, the guidance note itself is part of um some some other changes happening with the planning obligations uh, and section 106 processes at the moment some members will be aware of uh, the, the the draft section 106 spending protocol that's that's currently going through the um uh, the democratic process sort of in, in parallel to this uh which which sort of sits alongside this guidance note as as well to 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 give um some more information on on part of the section 106 process and the intention will be to, to make all of this nice and clear on on an updated website in the future so the uh the recommendations um here of the the, uh, the screening committee make any comments and suggestions on the the guidance note and recommend that it's adopted as non-statutory planning guidance um the, the reasoning behind it being non-statutory planning guidance is is simply that we uh spgs and adopted policy are already in place as as part of the, the, the development plan and adopted spgs so uh, we don't see a need for this to be uh, a full uh, SPG adopted. Um, so I'll I'll run very quickly through the the, the content of the guidance note, uh, and it starts by going through some background to planning obligations, what what they are, what what legal basis there is for seeking planning obligations, and how those those are calculated. Uh, again, the detail of, of the calculations come through uh, our SPGs, and the the intention is that a a basic calculator will be made available on, on online as well, so that interested developers or applicants can um, can work those out quite quite easily themselves. Uh, and also, viability is a key part of of this as as well, and uh, understanding the how viability is um is, is taken account of as as part of the planning process really and the the intention of this guidance is to make it clear that the onus is on the developer or the applicant to um to consider all development costs in particular planning the planning obligation costs as well when they're designing the scheme to um to, to make uh so that to give fewer uh, less justification for for applicants trying to reduce um, planning obligations on development. So it, it runs the uh, the guidance that runs through some of the issues like land value, uh, which is which is key importance really as part of viability, and the process for doing viability assessments, um, and and also how 
you know, what's what's required for for a planning obligation to um, to be entered into, including the, um, the the fact that a planning application can't be determined and a planning uh, permission granted until the obligation is is, is signed. So that's that's very very briefly really what's um what's in the guidance note there's there are uh two options really one to uh, as 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 per the recommendation to uh, adopt the guidance note as not non-statutory guidance to sit alongside um some some other other guidance information that we have or if if members would prefer it to be uh, be adopted as spg so i think that's that's about it from me if uh, if members have any questions okay richard thank you very much for presenting that i will open it up to the floor uh, any members online wish to make any comments or questions to the officers uh, councillor sam cotton <coughs> yeah sorry thank you chair so can i just clarify is this is it supposed to be a point of reference bringing did you say bringing together lots of other documents together as, as, a, as a single reference point it's yes so it's it, it can sort of signpost to those more <laughs> more detailed uh documents and the spgs and, and policies which are are in you know in in, in lo lots of different documents covering different aspects of of planning obligations and viability at the moment so so this is that sort of um for, first point really for for anyone who's who's not um who doesn't doesn't know much uh, or who wants to um isn't isn't a it's what, an idiot the, guide, the starting idiot it's basically it's the, 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 the no, no i won't say it's a idiot's guide to planning that's a that's a whole but, but as for, for planning obligations it's it's sort of the start the starting point for for planning obligations and viability really okay and then and then should you uh, have a burning desire to look deeper into it there would be more detailed documents available yes absolutely and that and that's where the um the the the, the guidance has has links to the relevant sections of of the council website and to national policy and guidance where all that all that detail can be found if you if, if you uh, which is where um which is where you'll you'll find those documents, which which are the, the sort of the statutory um, sort of development plan documents or the or the actual the, the legislation that have the have sort of the legal basis for for the content of of this document. Okay, so so when you say it's a non-statutory document, it doesn't it doesn't need to be statutory because <clears throat> the statutory documents lie behind this document. Ex is that correct? Ex exactly, that's right. That's right. right. Okay. Okay. Then thank you. Just, uh, oh, sorry. Councillor Chris, have you got your hand up yet? Yeah. Thanks, Chair. I, I want you to propose that we um, adopt the um, uh, option. Oh, Craggy, I've got the wrong glasses on. Sorry. Uh, adopt option one which I think is the uh, recommended advice. But um, I just wanted to make the comment I that um, whilst I understand the, I understand completely the rationale behind it. And I think it's the right way to go at the moment. I, I do hope that when the LDP comes before us at a later date, that we are able to address some of this differently, because I do feel that, um, the way in which the the viability process works does leave us out of pocket in terms of the contribution that we receive towards um, affordable home affordable housing. So I'll just leave it at there. But uh, but I propose I'm happy to propose that we adopt option one as the uh, uh, the recommendation. Thank you, uh, Councillor Chris. Do we have a seconder for that? Uh, Councillor Austin, did you raise your hand then? Oh no, who was that? Simon Cott. Thank you, Councillor Cott. Um, so we've got a proposer and seconder. Uh, just on the viability point, uh, I've always struggled with that, and uh, officers know uh, as a as a 
uh, what I consider a long-standing member of the planning committee. Um, but yeah, I don't think there are any other hands raised for questions or comments, so I will put it to the vote as we have a poser and seconder. Members could sh please show by raising their hands. And keep them up, please, while the officers count. And me in the chamber. That's it. Yes, that, that's been approved. Anybody against? And Councillor Harry's going to abstain because he left the room. Thank you. Thank you, members. And thank you, James and Richard. Uh, so we will now move on to... Item 10.2, which is the replacement local plan or the RLDP review of safeguarding and environmental improvements, employment sites, pages 142 to 376. And these will be presented uh, by James Harland, our uh, strategic planning policy manager. Thank you, James. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, this one's certainly not as cuddly as the goats by any means. It's a bit dry, this one, but... It's one of our, another document that we need to bring forward as part of the local development plan process, but I'm going to share a screen, uh, screen quickly if I could do, if that's okay, um, just to take through, because the officer that was dealing with this previously has now left the authority. So um, I want to thank that, well, thank that officer really to bring some of this work forward, but if it's okay, I'm going to share this. Let me know if you can see the, the presentation. We can see it. Yes, can you make I, it full screen? You can see it at home, Chair. Yeah. Yeah, Thank so you can make it. Okay. So, like I say, this is just another one of the background papers that we need to bring forward as part of the local development plan in terms mm -hmm. of the the um, the review of it. And it's quite a long process because the review of the LDP takes three and a half years to four years. So this is just one piece of it. And this, this report is looking at the review and safeguarding the improvement employment areas across the whole of the county borough. So I'm just going to take you through a few screens. There are only 10 of these screens, so we'll go through them pretty quickly. So the one that's in front of you is what the LDP will look like, the review, as we come forward with it. So you can see there's quite a significant number of policies covered under four strategic areas at the, at, at, at the top of the table there. So the strategic areas will cover housing, employment, et cetera, et cetera. The, the yellow arrow kind of points to where we're discussing today in terms of the level and scale of things uh, of what we're discussing today, where it's a small element of the, the, the plan that we need to bring forward and agree. But if we want, if we came forward with all of this plan at one go, then it would be impossible to adopt. So we need to drip feed a lot of this documentation, a lot of these policy areas through the fiscal process, because um, otherwise it wouldn't get approved by any means of form. But that what you see in front of you in effect and it is covered to a degree in the in the report itself is kind of how the ldp is going to look as it comes forward um, and as you'll see from those strategic sections and all those policy areas there's quite a significant piece of work we need to do each of those areas include evidence base they include land allocations and they include land designations as well all of those need to be agreed through the the political process we have a strategic planning group that's been set up uh, Councillor Liberal is the chair on that, Councillor Austin is vice, and obviously Councillor Emily is our portfolio holder for that as well. So we have quite a good governance arrangement in place for bringing the whole of the LDP forward. Um, so in terms of a bit of background, I think I've covered pretty much that first bit in terms of what we're doing in terms of reaching the, the LDP. But in terms of this document that we're bringing forward today, we have a need at the moment of around, probably around 20 hectares of new employment land that we need to bring forward over the plan period. So up to 2033, that accounts for around 1,800 to around 2,000 jobs that we need to account for within the county borough. So where's that land going? Where are those jobs gonna come from? But as part of that jobs calculation, we look at what we've already got, what's out there at the moment, so what we safeguard at the moment and those sites that we safeguard and what we do with those in the future. And this is what this report's about really in terms of what we've got in the existing plan. Um, so in terms of the coming on to this paper itself, so we've got around 79, as it says in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in the presentation there, we've got around 70 background papers. This is just one of those. 
This paper is about the review of the safeguard employment improvement area sites. Um, what we're doing today is only looking to get agreement from this, uh, from scrutiny in terms of the, the safeguarding land issues and not the policy position. The policy position will come at, the, uh, at a later date. So we're just looking at land issues, really. So we've currently got two policies in the LDP, one that looks at safeguarding sites. Um, so you'll see there that's there's 31 of them that we've got in the current LDP. And what we've had to do is review all those. And that's in line with kind of national guidance, how we review them. And there's a process for doing that. And I'll come on to that in terms of methodology, et cetera, in a minute, but very quickly. And when you look at the level of land we have that's safeguarded at the moment, it's 100, you know, 156,000 hectares to, be, uh, to a certain degree uh, covering those 31 sites. So 31 of those sites are covered under the current policy in the LDP, which is existing safeguarded employment sites. And what that means is we will not allow a loss of that employment land to any particular use unless in effect it, it results in jobs creation. So those sites are safeguarded to, in effect, stop maybe employment, uh, sorry, stop housing or, or, or maybe other uses, community uses on those lands. So we need to work out in terms of what we need to do in the future, in terms of that 20 hectares and what we need to do to safeguard these lands as well. So these lands have already taken into account um, in terms of those 20 hectares that we need to safeguard in the future. So these are very important to us in terms of what we need to do in the future in terms of um, protection and safeguarding. So there are 31 sites that we currently have in the plan. They are covered under EMP4. Of those 31 sites, 13 of them are also covered under the EMP, EMP policy five, which is industrial em environmental improvement areas. And what that policy wanted to do was, let's say there's an application that comes in on a certain site, like Builder Street, for example, we would work with the developer to look at planning obligations to say, look, this, the actual area of land is not in a, in a it's, it's not in a good condition in terms of landscaping, roads, signage, those sort of matters. So we'd work with the developer to take those funds or work with them to progress some of those areas to improve them environmentally and, and, and regeneration as well. So they're the third of those 31, there's 13 of those under this current policy as well. So in terms of the assessment and methodology, um, again, a lot of this is, is kind of general in terms of planning. So you've got the assessment criteria, so how we've assessed those 31 sites on the left-hand side there, which is generally, you know, these are the common assessment criteria that we use in terms of accessibility, deliverability, viability. Are these sites ever going to be used in the future? Um, and some of these are quite large, obviously, Builder Street, Tramal, Industrial Estate, Clandino Junction, all need to be looked at in specific detail. And the methodology there is on the right in terms of how we looked at that in greater detail, looking at the economics, where certain um, demand and supply is going in the future. So that's kind of the overall methodology and assessment for it. So in terms of the conclusions, so of the 31 sites that we've currently got in the LDP, under EMP4, so that's protecting and safeguarding the future. We still want to protect those and continue with those protection in the current LDP coming forward as well. So that's one of the recommendations we want you to consider today of those 31 sites. Of the in, uh, environmental improvement areas, of the 13 of those sites, there's four of them that we don't want to take forward for various reasons. Um, and they're the four that are on the screen in front of you. So you've got the former fisheries research site, um, the site predominantly is in very good condition, really, and we've been down there quite recently. It doesn't need to be on a, I don't think we'd be in a position to argue an examination in public that that, that site would need environmental improvement. Um, the same with Peel Street in Abergelly. Uh, quality and condition of the site presents no pressing need for improvement or refurbishment. Cader Avenue, St. Asif and Kimmel Bay site has been upgraded. I'm sure members are aware of that in terms of modern standards. And Station Yard in Clan Roost is a very small site anyway. Um, the, the actual state of those buildings are in good condition. They're quite modern. I think they were Welsh Government funded at the time. They don't need to be in that list of uh, environmental improvement areas or improvement areas overall. So like I say, the, the first recommendation is to continue with the 31 sites, uh, reduce the level of the environmental improvement sites from 13 
down to uh, down to seven. And then the other recommendation as part of this, of those 31 sites, we want to change the boundary as well. And the boundaries predominantly have been changed for pretty simple reasons, really, be it that you know, they could be open space or it's been um, developed for a different use altogether. So I'll just take these through, take these through quickly. So the first one there on the left hand side, um, as you know, is Abergelly Southeast. The current boundary in the plan is the red line. So that's what the LDP has at the moment. That's what it protects in terms of employment. We want to increase that to the, the yellow area there to the north. And that's because we've had two significant employment uses come forward. And we've also got a, a development area that's still outstanding. We want to protect that land going forward up to 2033. So these are the considerations we need to look at in terms of long term. Uh, the middle one there is Builder Street. Um, currently, Clandino Football Club falls within the safeguarded area. Um, so that what that means was if an application comes in for industrial units on that on that pitch, we potentially would look at it as being acceptable, subject to other matters in the plan like design, etc. So we're looking at taking the football pitch out. That's pretty common sense, I think. Same with the far right, which is Glen Conway. This is extended over time. So this is Glen Conway's industrial area. So this is the 4G, 5G pitch. The football pitch is here and the, and the clubhouse. So we want to take that land out. Um, coming on again to the, the couple more pages of these. So coming on to the far left, which is Conway. Again, that's Conway Football Club. We want to take it out of the safeguarded area. The middle one is uh, Mochra uh, Cricket Club. We want to take that out as well. The far right is Clandino Junction, which includes retail and housing. That need, now needs to come out uh, from a safeguarded area. And then the last two, obviously, is the, the one on the, on the left is where Little Aldi is. I never remember which one it is. Um, so in Clandino Junction, they need to come out of the safeguarded area because they're now retail. They're protected under different policies. So we need to take those out of those areas when we take this forward. And the other one is obviously tier fluid. The red area you see, so the red boundary area, is the, is the current LDP protection area. It doesn't include those lands to the south, which are pretty much built up for employment uses. A significant level of jobs there, which we want to protect in the future. So we want to extend that red line area to include those southern parcels as well as part of the plan. So the policy were to not allow the loss of those at all. Um, unless their jobs creation uh, up to 2033. So that's the boundary changes. So we've discussed the, the issues around the, um, the 31 sites in terms of safeguarding, which sites will be environment improvement areas in terms of reducing the 13. There are the boundary changes. So in terms of conclusions, recommendations, I've already said that we've got you know 156 uh, hectares of, of land from those 31 sites. The issue with those sites is that they're pretty much full. There's not much supply within them. Um, and of that supply that's available, it's tier fluid. Um, and that's those southern parcels as well. Uh, we know there's obviously development options that are coming forward on tier fluid, um, but we can't put all our eggs in one basket. So as part of the LDP and the market analysis work we've done as well is that we need to be progressing further sites to meet that 20 hectares we need in the LDP. Um, you know, between Abigail East, Landino Junction, Landino Conway, et cetera. So we will be coming forward in the future to increase the level of supply. So we're already looking at certain sites. They will come through the strategic planning group. There's going to be a site dropping session around June as well to meet those 20 hectares based on the fact that we don't have much supply. But the key thing is we need to protect what we've got. And this is what this, this, is what this report's about really, is to ensure that we progress those. One of the questions that's come up from members is, okay, if you're taking a football pitch out or a cricket pitch, what does that mean? Does it mean that you can develop it for housing? No, it doesn't, because they'll be protected under various other policies like open space or another use, be it landscape or whatever, but generally they'll be protected in the open space element. So. Like I said, coming on to the recommendations, it's back to what I said before, really. This report is a lot of work for little gain, but we've got to do it. It's a small element of our work. 
um, but we need to safeguard employment areas in terms of demand and supply in the future. So we want to protect the 31 sites, change the boundaries, but reduce the level of, uh, of the, the environmental areas that we've, we've previously um, identified in the plan. So that's it, Chair. Thank you very much, James. Um, I will open it up to the floor to see if there are any members who have any comments. <clears throat> I can't see any hands going up. Oh, Councillor Garonway, sorry. Let me uh, speak, even though I'm not on committee, obviously not part of my role. Uh, for my former roles in economic developments and the like, I am concerned with the moving, the changing environments we face as far as employment land, because certainly since COVID and since other, the way Robot, ro robotics have moved on and the way IT has moved on, that we do need to be flexible in our approach because sometimes we, we put land to one side because the Welsh Assembly says we need to do that. But we do need to look at what the emerging trends as far as employment is. And certainly it's changed immensely over the last couple of years uh, where there will be far more uh, hybrid working and working from home. So I think we need to be far more flexible in our approach. And it is a difficult challenge that... James and his team have in being having that flexibility because once you've designated land, it's very difficult to change that designation. So it's building in that flexibility. And also, I am aware that not just because from our policies, but also from, from national policies, it's becoming extremely onerous on some developers to develop land for industrial because of the environmental issues and wanting that it does put uh, developers off, you know, the, the, the amount of uh, uh, work that goes has to go into a planning application now can sometimes stifle developers. We have to be conscious of that fact, I think, because the last thing we want to do is is to stifle development. So it's trying to build that flexibility into any LDP is a real challenge. Uh, again, because government policy will dictate very often what we can and can't do. So it is uh, I I, I uh, um, appreciate the work that goes on in these groups, and it's, but it's that flexibility that we need to build in somehow, isn't it? Mm, indeed. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Come in there, Chair, if that's okay. Of course you can, James, yes. Because uh, both points are pretty, yeah, very important points. The first point is around how we build in the change, particularly around since COVID-19, and how we build in office development to deal with hybrid. So the work we've done around the Employment Land Review takes that into account. So we started to look at how densities of change in terms of how many people are working from home and how much land we need. So we, we build that into to the kind of demand and supply issues. Uh, the secondary issues as well, in terms of deliverability of the sites, the contamination issues, all those sort of matters which cost the developer, that's crucial to the LDP. We can't go forward with a site if it hasn't been fully assessed. And it's all about front loading now. So it's about the site owner to say to us, these are constraints, this is what's going to cost. If, if there is a, a financial gap within it, we wouldn't take that site forward. That site needs to be financially viable, it needs to be deliverable in every, in every, in every single way, really. And that's the same for housing and the same for employment. So certainly those are built in, Gromwe, but yeah, you're totally right without that, that we, we haven't got any certainty. Thanks, James, for that reply. I, I, I know you're aware of the situation. One other thing I think we do need to take into consideration the demise of the high street, where that leaves real potential for employment in our town centres that are now becoming almost wasteland in certain areas. So that is economic land that needs to be repurposed, in my opinion. Yep. Thank you, Garamay, yep. and thank you, James. So um, I'm looking for a proposer and seconder. Sorry, that screen's rather a fall. Thank you, Councillor Chris. You got your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I agree, I agree with everything that um, Councillor Bromway said. Uh, at the moment, these properties are, and these sites are susceptible to development for com for commercial use. And in the main, we, I, I think we would all agree that we would want to see them protected for the recreation and leisure use that they provide for our communities so i'm very happy to propose that we accept this uh that we accept the recommendation chair thank you very much uh councillor austin
Thank you. Thank you, Jack. I'm glad to be able to second uh, the proposal of Councillor Hughes that we approve of this report. And I'd like to thank James and his team for this excellent work that they've done. And I know that a lot of hours and time have gone into this report. And on behalf of all of us, I'd really like to thank James and his team for this report. Thanks. Excellent. Um, so we've got a proposer and seconder members. If you are happy, could you please show by raising your hands? And keep them up while the officers do a quick count. Ten online and two in the chamber. Thank you very much, members. I think that uh, concludes our evening. Uh, I want to thank the officers that have attended, James, and uh, uh, for the excellent report uh, just just presented, and uh, those members that have appeared online and those that are here in the chamber with us this evening. A safe journey home to those that are travelling, and uh, those that are at home, you, you can have a well-deserved cup of tea. Thank you. <laughs> oh, not forgetting right. the cabinet members as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Good, good, good timing. My tea is ready. Oh, there. Yeah, well.